hey, <laughs> seems I hit the 10 minute video limit on my last one. I didn't know there was a video limit. Anyway, uh, sorry about that. Uh, fortunately, it cut at uh, a good place, you know. <laughs> I was going to say, okay, let's skip this bit and, and, and run off and go to, the go to what's coming later, which is the really interesting bit. Um, so, uh, 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 yeah. Um, so then the author explains that if you show people um, the picture of a blurry fire hydrant and then you make it progressively um, uh, less blurry. If you make it less blurry in... Let me, I have to take, ask, end up with these things on. Um, if you make it less blurry in... You take two groups of people, uh, you make it less blurry for one group in ten steps and less blurry in five steps for the other one, okay? So one sees it become blurry with... Uh, whatever, uh, those who see the image become less blurry in 10 steps make worse, um, uh, they, they have more trouble identifying the object than those for whom it becomes less blurry in 5 steps. Uh, so basically it confirms that the more information you show people, the less likely they are to make a good uh, a good prediction. Or, um, yeah. So he says, yeah, the more information you give someone, the more hypotheses they will formulate along the way, and the worse off they will be. They see more random noise and mistake it for information. The problem is that our ideas are sticky. Once we produce a theory, we are not likely to, to change our minds, so those who delay developing their theories are better off. When you develop your opinions on the basis of weak evidence, you will have difficulty sorry, you will have difficulty interpreting subsequent information that contradicts these opinions, even if this new information is obviously more accurate. So I, I know that from personal experience. Um, two mechanisms are at play here. The confirmation bias we saw in Chapter 5 and belief perseverance, perseverance, the tendency not to reverse opinions you already have. Remember that we treat ideas like possessions and it will be hard for us to part with them. The confirmation bias he talks about um, is that basically if you have a hypothesis about something, you're going to tend to notice things that come to confirm it rather than things that go against it. For example, um, if, uh, I don't know, I've got this idea that uh, every time, um, I don't know, every time there's a full moon, uh, I hear more um, ambulance sirens, you know. Um, well, I'm going to notice the days when it happens, but if there's a day with a lot of ambulance sirens and it's not a full moon, I'll tend to just discount it. Uh, this is probably a really bad example, but uh, I can't come up with a better one just now, sorry. Um, con let's continue reading. I'm at page 144, if anybody wants to follow. The fire hydrant experience was done in the 60s and replicated several times since. I've also studied this effect using the mathematics of information. The more detailed knowledge one gets of em empirical reality, the more one will see the noise, i.e. the anecdote, and mistake it for actual information. Remember that we are swayed by the sensational. Listening to the news on the radio every hour is far worse for you than reading a weekly magazine because the longer interval allows information to be filtered a bit. Um, the Mm, yeah, the, the anecdotes are noise. This is because uh, earlier in the book he explains how uh, anecdotes trump statistics. That's why people are afraid of flying, right? We know the statistics. Flying is much safer than uh, driving your car. But each time there is a, a plane crash, it's sensationalized, okay? It's all over the papers. And so that is what influences us more than the statistics. Um... Yeah, continue reading. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm soon at the end. I'm going to leave you for tonight, hopefully. In 1965, Stuart Oskamp supplied clinical psychologists with successive files, each containing an increasing amount of information about patients. The psychologists' diagnostic abilities did not grow with the additional supply of information. They just got more confident in their original diagnosis. Granted, one may not expect too much of psychologists of the 1965 variety, but these findings seem to hold across disciplines. Finally, in another telling experiment, 
the psychologist Paul Slovic asked bookmakers to select from 88 variables in past horse races those that they found useful in computing the odds. These variables included all manner of statistical information about past performances. The bookmakers were given the 10 most useful variables, then asked to predict the outcome of races. Then they were given 10 more and asked to predict again. The increase in the information set did not lead to an increase in their accuracy. Their confidence in their choices, on the other hand, went up markedly. Information proved to be toxic. I've struggled much of my life with the common middle-brow belief that more is better. More is sometimes, but not always better. The toxicity of knowledge will show in our investigation of the so-called expert. That's what's coming up next, and I haven't read it yet. But basically, uh, the more information you give somebody to base their decision on, the more certain they are that their decision is correct, right? But it doesn't mean their decision is better. Okay, well, thanks for listening, and uh, if you have had the courage to listen to these two videos, please leave me a short video note or Twitter or whatever or something to tell me um, if it was totally useless. <laughs>